There we are. Tick tock, time to rock. I'll give you all one guess as to who caused us to be uh, 15 minutes late. It's not the man that doesn't know how to fix his chair. That was before. We were still on time. It's the man. <laughs> it's the man who who d- can't remember his password <laughs> to anything. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> well, let's go ahead and uh, test everything here because uh, was having mic problems earlier. Guys, do you hear us clearly? Um, I was getting some weird feedback from the mic. Just tell us everything is working, and then we're going to get started. Check, 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 check. Oh, someone said, someone said D Wood no sound. I don't believe that. I think that's someone who's messing around. Guys, we do we have sound? Just wanted to verify. Okay, everything's saying sound is good. Which means that Snoops in 100 is a troll. Probably the same person who always says there are sound problems in order to distract me. And hide user on this channel. It's easy. It's always a click away, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Don't do that again. All right. <clears throat> ladies. All right. We're getting verification that we have sound. All right. So we're going to talk about... Allah not being all wise, not being all powerful, not being unchanging. And these would be claims that Islam makes over and over again in the Quran. He's he's all wise, he's all powerful, and so on. Um, but Anthony's gonna give you just one argument, just one argument. There are a bunch. You could give a bunch of these arguments. He's gonna give you an argument based on one little passage of the Quran, and it's going to show how Muslims have some problems here. But uh, Anthony, why don't you introduce yourself for everyone in case in case anyone here is uh, is new? Yeah, so uh, my name's Anthony Rogers. I have been engaging Muslims for over two decades at least. I was converted like David in jail and I was surrounded by Muslims. I was an 18 year old kid. So I took an interest in Islam from the day of my conversion because I was interested in reaching out to Muslims among others. And uh, so in that capacity, I've written for Answering Islam for at least a decade. I've written with you on your blog for almost as long. And for the past two or three years have done videos on on your channel. So that's me, and I put up with David. So mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know that I've got to have an iron backbone. Yeah, and, and uh, you, have a, uh, you have an interesting personality in that people who normally get mad at everyone don't get mad at you, right? <laughs> you, you and John McRae. Hmm. Are the only people I know who are like that. Like, like me and Sam will flip out on anyone if we're if we're around that person for l- long enough. Um, uh, vocab will flip out on vocab. Vocab will eventually start whining and crying about things, and and, and he'll flip out on people, and people will flip out on him and stuff like that. But uh, no one ever gets <laughs> mad at Anthony or John McRae. Yeah, now John would have to give the breakdown. As you know, John. Oh, yeah, yeah, John yeah. He'll is, break down the personality type. John is an expert when it comes to evalu- or analyzing certain personality yeah. types. But my claim to fame is that Sam has never been mad at me. And if you know Sam, you know that's almost a miracle. Yeah. So, you know, Sam will be the first to tell you that <laughs> it doesn't take much for him to get upset with you. So the fact that, uh, you know, Sam and I have never had any kind of, uh, you know, issue uh lindy z said someone in chat mentioned chris hansen you should definitely do a skit where you are chris hansen confronting muhammad that's already in the works that's just uh the only thing stopping that right now is coronavirus but yeah it's going to be called to catch a prophet (laughs) it's going to be called to catch a prophet and uh yeah it's going to be muhammad uh muhammad comes over because he thinks he's uh you know found a, a prepubescent girl uh, who's willing to marry him and or or sign up for Muta? And uh, it's of course Chris Hansen. But the joke's gonna be the joke's gonna be that Muhammad's too dumb to figure out that there's not really a girl, right? So Chris Hansen's gonna explain it to him, and Muhammad thinks that Chris Hansen is just hiding the girl. And so, like the police will take him off, they'll arrest him, then he'll get out and he'll come back to the house, and he keeps coming back to the house and so on. So anyway, that's that's gonna be the uh, joke. But yeah, it's gonna be. 
To Catch a Prophet with uh, David Wood as Chris Hansen. All right. Now, should we go ahead and should we go ahead and get started? We will take we will take. Uh, hey, that's an interesting one. Do John of Damascus meets Muhammad mm -mm. with with Al D? <laughs> Who's Al D? Oh, maybe met Al Fadi. I don't know. As John of Damascus, that would be a good one. Um, <clears throat> all right, so. Uh, Viking Apache said, Anthony, do you get mad at Muhammad? Yeah, that's weird. Do you get mad? <laughs> do you get ticked well, off? Well, like, like, like I will, the world can be crashing down around me. I can have people stomping on me, kicking my head. I'm, I'm totally calm, but I will like lose my pen and not be able to find it. And I'll flip out and be ready to smash everything in sight. So it's like little things. They tick me off big things. I'm totally calm. Do you like get, get ticked off and mad or I, I can get animated, but I don't typically get mad. Uh, I often tell people when it comes to my wife and I, you, know, you and Marie have a perfect, uh, you know, uh, interaction with each other. If anybody mm -hmm. hasn't seen David and Marie interact, it's perfect. But they're not the same personality type, mm -hmm. right? Well, uh, my wife, if a if a tree fell into our house and there was a big hole in it, you know, my wife would be immediately in you know damage control mode. Try, you know, what are we supposed to do? That sort of thing. I'd be over there thinking, great, now we've got more sunlight but you mm -hmm. know we've got a sunroof in our house or mm -hmm. you know something along those lines there's not much that, that gets me down uh, you know so uh, typically when I see so for example I was riding up and David dropped a video and I was just laughing hilariously in the car on the way up at the same time what David was talking about was horrendous and repugnant right so I mean I have natural revulsion to what I see uh, in Muhammad's character and behavior and there's a sense in which I am incensed at what he said and taught and the fact that people imitate his practice, but not, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, I, I'm not in a rage in, in that sense. My, my thought is more, you know, expose Muhammad more because of it than it is to just sort of, uh, yeah, but I don't get, I don't get upset too much at mm -hmm. uh, anything. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, um, Anthony's argument here will not take up a terribly long amount of time um, even with me jumping in and adding my thoughts so we will be taking some questions along the way um, people keep giving me suggestions you you, you, you didn't hear on our, our last live stream with me and, and vocab and uh, John? John McRae where we you hear that we were planning a horror movie we're gonna have a no, I didn't see that one. Yeah, we're going to have a horror movie in inside a cave, but it's going to be like an hour and a half full horror movie, but it's about Muhammad receiving <laughs> yeah. his first revelations. Yeah, you know I can already mean? see where that's going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be pretty uh pretty uh it's going to be pretty graphically violent and bloody. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. So okay. I, I I would start off with this. The argument can be made quickly, but I mm. want I want to make sure that people are going into this remembering several things. One of the first things that people should remember is Muhammad's initial interest or attraction to Judaism and Christianity. Mm -hmm. Right? Muhammad was a dyed-in-the-wool pagan. He was uh, a product of pagan parents. He grew up in a pagan tribe that was uh, part of a broader you know, network of, of pagan worship. The caravan trade that came into Mecca involved the worship of, of you know, multiple deities and Allah was only one of many. And so, But the point is that in that context, if, if anybody hasn't heard a Jewish person really ridicule and lampoon idolatry, you really haven't uh, heard uh, anything when it comes to just you know cutting idolatry off at the knees. And, and the origin of this, of course, is in the Old Testament prophets. Mm -hmm. you, know, you look at the prophets and you have Isaiah talking about uh, an idolater cutting down a tree it's one of the coolest passages in yeah. the Bible. <laughs> and then he talks about, I mean, it's just... It, it, it's, he makes a fire and bakes some bread yeah, on it. And then yeah. he takes the other part and yeah. he bows down and worships it. Yeah, but, <laughs> and, 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 yeah. so so half of it, half of it he, he uses to make a fire. So the same material that he's constructing a god out of is, is fuel for the fire. And the other half, after he makes it into a god, he bows down to it and says, you made me, right? So you, you just see the, the foolishness mm -hmm. of it. And that sort of thing is found throughout the prophets, and it was imitated by the Jews. If you look in the Talmud or other rabbinic literature, you just find this scathing uh, rebuke of idolatry. And and this is the context then in which Muhammad is is uh, you know living and moving and having his being in Mecca. 
the, the pagans are engaging in ridiculous idolatry and the Jews are constantly making fun of it. And even though they're in a minority, uh, they're, they're still getting the upper hand when it comes to the rhetoric, the r- r- rhetorical battle, right? And so, uh, I mean, that's one factor weighing on Muhammad. Another thing is that the Jews and the Christians have a concrete revelation from God. They don't just have these traditions from the murky past that nobody knows for sure where they came from and what basis they have. And they're also not sufficiently detailed. I mean, they just lack all sorts of things that a person who has a revelation has. Mm -hmm. And so this this becomes very attractive to Muhammad. And the Jews, as well as the Christians, uh, believed in in prophets who were authoritative spokesmen. And the Jews in particular were still waiting for someone. In fact, they would constantly bring this up in their uh, battles with, with the Jews and say that, you know, he's going to come and then he's going to aid us against you. He's going to help us overthrow uh, your, you know, uh, your dominance over us. And so all, all this is, is happening. And uh, eventually Muhammad gets the idea. We don't need to, to go over all of that, right? We, uh, he gets the idea that, that he's a prophet. And in fact, he's that prophet that they were expecting, the Jews. And so there, there was a lot about the religion of the Jews that he that appealed to him, but there was also stuff that he didn't like. Uh, of course, he, he couldn't agree with the ethnic aspect of it, right? He's an Arab. So, so there's going to be, uh, you know, the idea that he could become a Jew, just, you know, that wasn't something that he could hurdle. So he wanted something especially adapted to his own uh, Arab uh, situation and so of course he claimed that he is the prophet for the Arabs. He's getting revelation in Arabic, and uh, he's sent then in spe- uh, in particular to his people. That meant that Muhammad then wanted to pattern his deity after the God of Jews and Christians, which means that his God has to be Almighty, all knowing, and unchanging, among other things. There, there's of course a whole host of attributes that would have to be true of him. So you do find in the Quran claims, right? You, you have the claim that Allah is all of those things. Mm-hmm. And one of, the, one of the ways the Quran expresses this is one that Muslims love to bring up for various reasons, but it's the expression kun fayakun. Uh, that means, uh, you know, be and it is. And it, it, the idea is that all Allah has to do is say be, and whatever he says be in reference to happens. So if Allah wants to create a gnat, all he has to do is say B. If he wants to create a solar system, all he has to do is say B. If he wants to create a universe, all he has to do is say B. Which means... It's all, all equally easy for him. Everything is equally easy for Allah. There's there's nothing uh, harder than another thing. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, as you, one second there, one second there. We've got uh, the Islam critiqued troll, Colin, coming in here talking trash. He says, you think you're the best at pointing out problems with Muhammad's morality? Mm-hmm. I just finished a script that will give you a run for your money. Challenge accepted. Well, Colin, you have to get the challenge right. I didn't say I'm the best at pointing out problems, right? Christian Prince is phenomenal at pointing out problems. Sam Shamoon is phenomenal at pointing out problems. I said I'm the best at mocking. The best mocker. <laughs> so if you're mocking it better if you dude I, I i'm looking forward to the day when someone can out mock me because th- that islam's really through then um what <laughs> no no i'm laughing because because i like islam critique style is awesome yeah he, he has a good dry uh wit and and i like that yeah and um, uh uh the stuff the stuff i i, I like it because the stuff he's putting out is stuff other people aren't putting out right yeah, yeah like it's it's easy to come along and put out the same stuff that everyone like let, that's like you right you're putting out stuff that other people aren't putting out there um so yeah but but i recognize that david is the master mocker which is why sometimes i have this brilliant idea and i think i got to give this to david because he's going to deal he's going to use it better than i would he'll do that but, he'll say he'll say he'll say uh, he'll say hey i've got this awesome idea for a video but you should do it cuz uh yeah i mean i i just be much more savage yeah <laughs> yeah so uh I, I can detect certain problems but the you know some things deserve a certain touch so <laughs> All right, Islam Critique, challenge accepted. And by the way, you can come on uh, come on live if you want to uh, discuss it after you post it. We could even uh, play clips of it and discuss it and see where you're going. 
Um, and Child of Jesus Christ says, Sir David, I've shared your video to my Muslim teacher in Malaysia, and she told me she will check whether you are correct or not. Spoiler alert, I am correct. If if she doesn't uh, if she doesn't notice that, then um, tell her to tell her to check that again. All right, Anthony. Okay, so so that was that was the setup. So uh -huh. what I'm driving at won't be surprising to people. Muhammad at heart is a pagan, but he's claiming that he's a prophet of the God of the Jews and Christians. He is a, a inspired individual. His revelations have their origin with Allah, which, which means then that they're going to be free of the stain of paganism. Any kind of uh, paganism that otherwise affected Muhammad would be overcome by virtue of the fact that the origin of his revelations are from Allah, not at all from himself. And of course, the Islamic sources claim that Muhammad was purified, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the tall tales in Muhammad's uh, youth is that he had some episode where he was thrown down to the ground, which was later interpreted as his heart being, uh, his chest being split open. But how did they interpret it then? Yeah, yeah, they, they, they thought that it was a sign of demonic possession. <laughs> and, and apparently, uh, Muhammad uh, also, you know, that, that was his view uh, because uh, it, it was his most natural interpretation of other experiences that he had. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, in particular, his experience in the, the cave on Mount Hira. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that means that uh, if, if Muhammad was a pagan at heart and he's not really receiving revelations, we might expect Muhammad to have some Freudian slips along mm -hmm. the way, right? Oh, he's got some. While, while trying, it's sort of like when I got here, I got to the door and David opened the door and he said, Oh, Tony. I'm mad to see you. I mean, I'm glad to see you, right? Uh -huh. uh, that, that would be a Freudian slip. Well, uh, oh, we, we recorded <laughs> we recorded uh, Muhammad meets Sigmund Freud with the <laughs> apostate prophet as Sigmund Freud. And there were all kinds of Freudian slips <laughs> out there. Everything Muhammad says is a Freudian slip about loving little girls or something like that. Oh, gosh. That's, uh, that's classic. Uh. And uh, Freud, we got Freud. He keeps snorting cocaine because he's, he's getting more and more freaked out by the uh, oh. horrible things uh, Muhammad, is, Muhammad is saying. That makes um, me think you could do a uh, Sherlock Holmes because you mentioned <clears throat> cocaine. I was Ooh, thinking Muhammad meets Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Holmes. Remember he did heroin? Yeah. He thought it was uh, useful medicinally, <clears throat> but... You know, apparently <laughs> didn't know its devastating effects. But uh, notice Shamuni in here. Why is that loser Anthony in your house? <laughs> notice Sam can't just mind his own business. He has to come over here to everyone else's live stream, do a hit and run because no one watches <laughs> his and he gets jealous and he wants his name mentioned. So people can uh, can maybe go over and watch his live stream, which they're not because uh, his live streams aren't any good. By the way, Sam, uh, Dale Tuggy has some choice words to say about you on his terrible Facebook uh, page. But don't challenge him to debate because he won't. He'll run. Uh, Lena says, I have binge watched all videos on Act 17 Apologetics. Crave more. Oh, <laughs> well, I've been cranking out one or two a day and there will be more tomorrow. Um, Michael Lawler here said, what's with the kids tea set mugs? Um, I don't es actually drink. Espresso. I don't drink cups of espresso. I will have. I will add them to a cup of coffee. So I'll have like a giant, uh, a giant cup of coffee, and then add some espresso shots to it. But I don't. I don't just drink these. But whenever Anthony's Italian, so whenever he comes here, then my wife uh, makes espressos, and I'm not going to let them sitting there drinking espresso without without <laughs> me having one. Um, I, I come up here for two reasons, maybe three. The first reason is an espresso, and I usually get what uh, you know, two or three. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's... every couple hours. The second reason is Kepler, their their youngest child. Yeah, he's pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> and other than that, we record a bunch of crap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's the possible third reason. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah. So, if anyone's wondering, Sam's wondering uh, what Anthony's doing here. Unlike Sam Shamoon, Anthony is going to be recording a bunch of videos on some groundbreaking stuff. All right. Before you were rudely interrupted by Sam Shamoon. Okay, so I mentioned Freudian slips. Mm -hmm. That that's one angle uh, of. Oh, I I rudely interrupted you then because yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I started talking about the video. Then we went. Okay, never mind. I, I thought you knew. <laughs> uh, so so that's that's one way of looking at what I'm about to talk about. Another way of looking at it is Muhammad, while claiming to be speaking for the same God who revealed Himself to the prophets in the prophetic scriptures. Uh, 
taught things that were more in line with his pagan background mm -hmm. and then later had to be corrected on them by the Jews. And you actually find this all throughout the Islamic sources. A lot of the present beliefs that Muslims hold were not the original beliefs of Muhammad or his companions. And that's because, not, not because Allah uh, came along and said, Muhammad, you know, this is wrong, you know, you need to change this. The, the fact of the matter is, it was usually the Jews who were the catalyst for mm -hmm. Muhammad's new insight. Yeah, you see this a lot in the Hadith. So guys, just, just to be clear here, right? Muslims, Muhammad's teaching his companions something. They're all going around doing what Muhammad taught. And then the Jews come along and say, what are you doing? You don't know how pagan that is? And then Muhammad like, oh, 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 yeah, oh, uh, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, here's the way we do it now. And it'll be exactly what the Jews told him to do. Yeah. Right? So. so the order is not Allah revealing things to Muhammad and then making it known to his uh, companions and the Jews and others in Arabia. The order is the Jews, Muhammad, and then Allah. So look, notice who's in last place. The Jews are always one step ahead of Muhammad, two steps ahead of Allah. Allah's always the last to, to arrive on the scene and speak accurately, mm -hmm. right? And, and he's basically walking in the footsteps of the Jews that were already, uh, you know, uh, walked in by Muhammad before him. So uh, here's an example of that. Uh, David's done a video, uh, which I think is one of his best. Unfortunately, it was in the earlier days of his YouTube uh, forays. I, I was, so, I was, I was just getting a request. I mean, I've been, get, I, I get these requests pretty regularly, but j just like, and maybe an hour or two before you got here, um, someone was saying, "Could you re-upload those other videos?" Because people don't see them now. They don't get recommended now. And so could you re-upload those earlier videos? But I've actually been thinking about re-recording some of those earlier videos because I had a crap camera. Right. I had a crap mic. Everything was garbage. It's low resolution. Whereas now can record everything, re-record everything. So not for all the videos, but for like maybe like the 10, my 10. If I picked out like my 10 or 15 favorite videos from years ago, like 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 Who Killed Muhammad. Mm -hmm. That one's got over, some of these videos have over a million views and stuff like that. That one's got, you know, one point something million, stuff like that. But I, w when I look at it, I'm like, the camera is horrible. <laughs> the mic is horrible. There's all this background noise. And so, yeah, I think I could do a much more epic job today. So, yep, that's, uh, but yeah, one of them, one of them that I would like to redo is Allah swearing by everything and, and committing shirk. Yeah. So so in that in that video, the main focus is on the fact that Allah, who's supposedly transcendent, absolute, the creator and maker of everything, he's swearing by created things. And if you're familiar with the previous scriptures, if you're familiar with the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know that God swears by himself because there's none greater by whom he can swear and the lesser always swears by the greater. And so, biblically, in terms of the monotheism taught by the prophets and the apostles, God can't swear by anything other than himself because there is nothing greater than him. Nothing to which he must appeal, uh, nothing that uh, can hold him to account I mean, except his own eternal being and nature. So that's what you see in, in the Bible. Well, Muhammad, before he knew this, but while claiming to be a prophet, has Allah swearing by himself over and over and over again in the Quran. Allah swears by literally everything. There is nothing, you cannot name something that Allah did not swear by, right? So, so notice, notice the reasoning here. According to Muhammad, after the Jews corrected him, the, according to Muhammad, if you swear by anything other than God, you have associated it as a partner with God. If you say, I swear by this, you're, you're calling upon that thing. You're calling upon that thing to uh, somehow uh, be a, a kind of, of judge and enforcer over what you've said, right? So Muhammad eventually said, hey, Allah is the only one you should be appealing to that. He's the only one that can, you know, hear this. He's the only one that can enforce it. He's the only, you don't, don't be calling on all these other things. So if you swear by anything other than Allah, um, you're associating as a partner with Allah. And so the point, of the, the point of the video was, yes, in the Quran, Allah swears by everything. Allah's constantly, I swear by this, I swear by that, I swear by the pen, I swear by the stars, I swear by the moon, I swear by this, I swear by that, I swear by this. 
Um, and there's even a passage where he says, I swear by the seen and the unseen. Well, guess what? There's, o- there's only two categories of things, seen and unseen, right? So if he's swearing by both, everything that's seen and everything that's unseen, Allah has sworn by everything. And therefore, according to Muhammad, Allah has associated everything as a partner with himself. And Islam is thus not monotheistic, it's it's pantheistic. Like every everything, everything you see is God. Yeah, so so let me read the hadith just so people know uh, that this comes from the Muslim sources. So this is from Sunan An Nisai. It's from uh, Volume Four, Book Thirty Five, Number Thirty Eight O Four. It says it was narrated from Abdullah bin Yasar from Katela, a woman from Juhaina, that a Jew came to the Prophet and said, "You are setting up rivals to Allah and associating others with Him. You say." Whatever Allah wills and you will, and you say, buy the Kaaba. So when you say buy something here, like buy, buy the Kaaba, you're saying, I say it by, and buy the Kaaba. That, that's a way of swearing. You're swearing by the Kaaba. Right. And so here's how it concludes. So the prophet commanded them, meaning his companions, if they wanted to swear an oath to say by the Lord of the Kaaba and to say whatever Allah wills, then whatever you will. So there, there's actually two issues here. Uh, we're just focusing on uh, on the fact that it's the Jews that are the catalysts for this insight and subsequent command, a change of command from originally allowing the practice of swearing by created things, and all they're doing in this case is following Allah's bad example, right? But now the Jews having corrected Muhammad, uh, and and remember this is this is dealing with shirk. It, it, this isn't one of the uh, minor sins. Muslims talk about major sins and minor sins. And it's not even one major sin among many. This is the worst sin according to the Quran. Uh, Surah 348, Surah 3116, both say that the sin of shirk associating partners with Allah is unforgivable. Well, here is uh, a Jew correcting Muhammad, Allah's greatest prophet, who came to rid the world of shirk, Right. I mean, mm-hmm. what need do we have of Muhammad if he has to be corrected by the Jews on this fundamental issue? Mm-hmm. I mean, this already unravels the entire, uh, you know, claim of Islam. Uh, but so, th- so this gives you an idea. Muhammad was in fact a pagan. He was not a prophet. He was not pagan receiving. Re- What's that? That sounds like a cool video. Pagan at heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Oh, I- I've I've also been planning to do something maybe maybe here in the next couple days. Um, I think you and I have talked about this before. Um, I don't want to say, uh, I'm not sure what to call it. Maybe replacement pag- paganism, where Muhammad takes the the the, the, the paganism, paganism of his time, but he ends up giving them a replacement that's kind of the same thing. Like, so for instance, the birds, right? Yeah, yeah, we talked so, about that. So ladies and gentlemen, you have the uh, famous story of the satanic verses where Muhammad received... Uh, is a revelation that was part of the Quran uh, saying that you could pray to three pagan goddesses, Alat, Alus, and Manat. And these are called the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. So notice it's these three pagan like bird goddesses. And the idea if they're these like bird goddesses and they, they can fly back and forth between you and Allah interceding for you that way, right? Now, every Muslim on the planet would immediately recognize that as absolute indisputable paganism. Right? You, what? You've got all these inter- intercessory birds flying in between you and Allah? What is this pagan nonsense, right? Every Muslim will recognize it until you show him that his prophet actually replaced it with a different kind of uh, bird intercessors. Right? Muhammad said in the Hadith that, that you know, when, when you get down to the, to the resurrection time, Chapters of the Quran are going to appear as flocks of birds to intercede for you. So notice before, every Muslim on the planet would recognize, hey, if you've got a bird goddess flying between you and Allah interceding for you, that's absolute polytheistic pagan nonsense, right? But Muhammad makes it the Quran. And these individual chapters of the Quran are going to appear as flocks of birds who are going to intercede for you. So these these flocks of birds are going to be flying in between you and Allah, telling Allah, oh, Allah, he did this and this and this and that and so on. And so these flocks of birds now intercede for you. And suddenly, when you put it like that, a Muslim, nope, that's not paganism. It's just pure monotheism. Really. 
You've got all these birds, all these birds flying around, and they're interceding with you. They're conscious. They have thoughts. They have memories. They're they're appealing to Allah on your behalf, just like the just like Allah and Allah Alusa and Manat did. But because they're the Quran doing it, it's no longer paganism, right? And Muslim, yep, it's not it's not paganism. And so this is that's what I mean. Like he takes every single thing the pagans believed in and he gives them an Islamic substitute. He gives them he gives them an Islamic substitute, and like everything, the black stone himself himself is an intercessor. Everything is substituting for something that the pagans had, and somehow Muhammad gives them the exact same thing. It, it, usually worse. I mean, you got three pagan goddesses, but now you've got and he makes it. it it's much worse, right? Now you've got ent entire flocks, entire flocks of birds that are inter interceding on your behalf, and so it's just it's just complete replacement paganism. And so that's why the Jew, that's why Muhammad's doing this. And the Jews keep coming up to him and go, you, you, even, you have any clue what you're doing, dude? Do you have any idea what you're doing? And uh, so anyway, things didn't go well for the Jews in that area who kept correcting him. Yeah, so let's give him, let's give him the verse. Th this is the verse. Now, uh, I'm going to give it to you the way a lot of uh, translations render it. Okay, it's the sort of thing, even if it's translated accurately, you could possibly miss it. Mm -hmm. Once you see it, you realize it's a huge problem. But it's the sort of thing you could just read right over it. Uh, and to verify that, I've, I've always read right over this. Yeah. I, I never stopped and thought, oh, here's a problem. Yeah. So until, until you pointed out, I never, I never thought there was a problem here. And it's the same sort of thing. I mean, anybody can... You know, something else will catch your attention while you're reading it because mm -hmm. there, there's a lot going on. It's the same thing in the Bible. You read through the Bible, you notice something a second time that you didn't notice the first time, and, and so forth. So this is just a product of, of reading and rereading, and also reading various translations, and then trying to figure out when you notice that that uh, translations are different, what accounts for that difference? Is it just because there's more than one way to express this in uh, English? And one one translator is choosing a different term, or is there some deeper, uh, more profound explanation? And in this case, you're about to find out why a lot of translations render it inaccurately. So I'm going to read. Uh, I'll read one. Maybe there's uh, there there's some that David wants to read, but this is Shakir's translation. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is a standard uh, translation of the Quran. This is Surah 30, verse 27. It says, and he it is, talking about Allah, who originates the creation, then reproduces it, and it's easy to him, and his are the most exalted attributes in the heavens and the earth, and he is the mighty, the wise. Now, contextually, what's going on here is Allah, supposedly, is re answering the pagans who are mocking the idea of the resurrection. To them, this is an absurd notion. And so what Allah is supposedly doing here is giving them a logical reply. He's saying, in effect, I created things the first time, and so when I reproduce them, it's going to be easy for me, right? I did it before, and, it, and it's a piece of cake, right? That's, that's the gist of it. And remember, I mean, the Islamic sources say Allah's almighty. In fact, this verse says at the end that Allah is the mighty, the wise. And the idea there is he's almighty. He's all wise. In fact, that's how some other translations render it. So here is a verse that uh, addresses uh, an act of Allah's power and in the process also claims that he is all powerful. But the problem is, that's not what the verse actually says. Mm -hmm. The Arabic word that's used there for the word easy is ahwanu, and it means easier. And so, so here's what the verse is literally saying. This is, uh, I'm using now the uh, translation of Dr. Mustafa Katab. So again, this is 30, uh, Surah 30, verse 27. This is the clear Quran, the so-called clear Quran, by the way. Uh, he, I, I don't know why he would choose to call it the clear Quran when the Quran is the, the most incredibly ambiguous book on the planet. But his translation called the clear Quran has it this way. He is the one who originates the creation, then will resurrect it, which is even easier for him. Mm -hmm. now, now, help me out here, David. I thought we already established that there's nothing... 
harder for Allah than another thing. Everything is equally easy for him because when he does something, all he has to do is say B. It's not any harder to say B in one case than to say B in another case. If Allah has absolute power, there's no resistance to his power. It's not as if he has to overcome some kind of resistance. Mm -hmm. If Allah is all-powerful, then then even speak in terms of greater or lesser degrees of difficulty uh, already is unintelligible, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, so, so ju ju just to be clear here, just to be clear here, ladies and gentlemen, the Quran is talking about talking about two things: C creation, right? Creation, and then the the resurrection. And Allah says that the resurrection is going to be easier than the creation. Resurrecting everything is going to be easier than creating it in the first place. And I see, because uh, I have a bunch of translations in front of me, I see a bunch of translations that translate it as easy or simple or most easy, but then I see a bunch which give the literal translation that it's actually easier. Right. It's easier for him to resurrect it than to create it. But so Anthony's pointing out, think about the implication there. All he has to do to create something is say B, and it, it pops into existence. And he's saying it's easier for him to resurrect something. And there it sounds like, well, I've already created everything. It's even easier for me to resurrect things. And so that that, that almost makes it sound like, well, I've already, you know, I've had some practice. Yeah. I've had some practice before. And so now I've learned and now I can now I can do it. But Allah hit the gym. Yeah. So if it's if it's if it's easier for him to resurrect than to create, then it, that means it was it was harder for him to create than it is to resurrect. So something is harder for him, and so yeah, yeah those are we those have are some issues. Those are comparative terms. If you say easier with respect to mm -hmm. one thing, you're, you're saying the other thing was harder by comparison. Let's now, get, now another thing, just just to uh, sort of sink these a bit. The Quran is not presenting resurrection as something other than creation. This is just a second act of creation. Mm -hmm. the, the literal uh, Arabic actually says he will reproduce it, meaning he's going to do the same thing over again. So it's the same act that uh, this time is going to be easier. Mm -hmm. so, so resurrection, I mean, we might think, okay, mm -hmm. well, these it's things are creating already, everything anew. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so it's just another uh, occasion when he's going to do the same thing. But, but uh, the point is that he's already done it once before, and, and, and the suggestion is, now, now th just think about it. This is the way a person would naturally think with respect to himself, right? Or any other finite deity. If you do something, the next time you do it is probably going to be easier. Certainly, the more often you do it, it's going to become easier, right? And so what, what, what should be happening is if Allah is the one speaking, then it would, it would simply say easy. It'll be easy for him. But if Muhammad's the one thinking and accidentally has a Freudian slip, mm -hmm. right? His, his the, the the paganism that he's he's trying to uh, you know cloak in the guise of Jewish and Christian monotheism, uh, you know uh, that cloak has sort of uh, you know brushed aside like uh, Zainab's robe or something, right? Mm -hmm. And and now the the paganism is being exposed. Muhammad has expressed himself as a pagan would instead of how he should have if he were, in fact, literally verbally dictating or reciting what Allah had revealed to him. Now, I see you're laughing, so somebody must have made some comment. I'm, I'm laughing. Uh, several people have posted something along these lines. Uh, Konal says, then he doesn't say B, he only says B, <laughs> making it easier. <laughs> he doesn't say the whole B. It's, it's got to be easier. So That's funny. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have got that initially. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, but now, so now, what do you think, David? What do you think when Muslims run into a statement of the Quran? So, of course, I mean, I'm not the, I, I think I, I, I'm the first person that I know of apologetically who's noticed this. I'm not so arrogant as to think nobody has, has, has noticed this, but I've never heard and, and I've, you know, read and, and, and listened to people. So, I, I, you know, I think I'm pretty well familiar with a lot of stuff out there, but um, I'm I, I'm sure that Muslims have to have seen this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I, I, actually, we've got some dispute from Nona Bubble here, um, and we could we could probably ask some of the uh, some of the Arabs uh, some some of the Arab speaking, both Muslims and Christians, and anyone else, uh, atheists, whoever, 
uh, in the in the chat who want to comment on this. But Nona says in Arabic there's no easy easier uh, easier. There's only t easiest. I think she meant there. It, there is only two degrees. It's either easy or easiest. Um, I got some problems because we've got all sorts of commentaries and all kinds of translators who say it's easier. I know it's. I know Arabic has a comparative like Allahu Akbar is not God is greater. great or even God is greatest. It's God is greater. Right. And so you've got the comparative. So everyone, Nona Bubble here is saying um, well, let, that there's no comparative of... Let me make a couple of observations here. If you go online to the islamawakened.com website and you select the, the link at the top <laughs> called Quran... You go to you scroll down to Surah thirty twenty seven, mm -hmm. and then you go to the uh, uh, if you scroll up here. Why are you pointing to oh, it? They can't see where you're pointing. But I'm telling you in case you okay. want to do this. But uh, and then so if you you go to Surah thirty twenty seven, you'll notice a a row of four columns there. If you press the word for word column, it says easier. Right, and yeah, then matter of fact, I'll, I can put this on the screen. Okay. Yeah, I'll so, put this on the screen so people know what we're talking about. But now this is just. This is just one option. So this is a, it gives you the, the, the breakdown of the words. It tells you what they mean. It's an Arabic corpus. Okay, so there it has easier. Mm -hmm. I went before, when I saw this, I thought this is a huge issue. I, I should make sure that what I think I've discovered is in fact valid. So I went, first of all, I just texted Al-Fadi, right? I texted him because he's a native Arabic mm -hmm. uh, speaker. And he said, you're right. And then he went and checked a bunch of Arabic commentaries and he said, they all agree with you, right? And then, uh, now I'm going to make a video on this. Because this is, you know, we're doing a live stream now, but I'm going to make a more succinct video, just sort of distilling a lot of this. I, I searched, one of the things I like to do in my videos is I like to find Muslims who are making certain observations that I'm making so people can't, you know, use the Arabic trump card and say you don't speak Arabic or, you know, other excuses that people make. And I, I have videos of Muslim scholars who are trying to deal with this verse. So this isn't me making up a meaning for a, for an Arabic term. It's on the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, you can find it in standard reference works. You can find it in the commentators. You find it in Muslim scholars. Nobody, I think, would who, who's ever heard Yasser Qadi would accuse him of not knowing Arabic, mm -hmm. for example. Um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, Joe is putting easy, easier, easiest, and he's putting the Arabic words there. Guys, uh, you, you Arabic speakers, um, look, look at look at what's up on the screen. So you have the you have the Arabic of the verse there, and then you have the literal. So they just translate it word by word, giving the literal translation, and they translate this part as it is, and it is easier for him, and for him is the description. So. Yeah, and, and there's even a further breakdown. Uh, I won't have you go there, but but if you use this tool, you'll eventually notice there's a there's another way to look at the breakdown of various words, and it shows you that the word means easier. It's mm -hmm. ahwanu. Now, uh, so that's not how Muslims who are scholars try to deal with the verse, right? Mm -hmm. They know that the word means easier. And they try to they try to explain it explain some reason for it right, right? And, and what do you call that the miracle of reinterpretation that's right and <laughs> and so what normally what you normally find in the commentators is not somebody making the uh, the claim that the word doesn't really mean easier what you what you have them doing is trying to reinterpret what Allah is doing here and so the the, the classic response is from Ibn Abbas. Okay, so, so notice this. Ibn Abbas is trying to deal with this issue. Why would Ibn mm -hmm. Abbas, of all people, right? He is the cousin of Muhammad. Do you think he knew Arabic? I'd say he probably knew it pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So Ibn Abbas is trying to deal with this. And here was his argument. He says what Allah is doing here is he's saying, if, this is what he means, right? If it were hard for him the first time, then it would be easier for him the second time. Because whenever somebody does something, it's easier the second time than it is the first time. So even a boss is presupposing that it means easier. Mm -hmm. And if even a boss doesn't know Arabic, then I'm afraid nobody else does, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, and, he, and he certainly knows the uh, uh, Quranic Arabic better than anyone else does. He's the cousin of Muhammad. 
And so, uh, but, but notice, this is not what the Quran says, right? This is a reinterpretation of the Quran. Ibn Abbas has to add words to the verse in order to make it consistent with what Ibn Abbas knows would have to be uh, the, the actual expression if he was going to say uh, something that's consistent with his absolute power, right? So Ibn Abbas knows that the verse, as it is stated in the Quran, does not communicate accurately. So, so notice, though, what, what, what ends up happening if, if you follow Ibn Abbas, right? Not only do you now have Allah expressing himself in a way that exposes that he's not really all-powerful, but now, uh, now what you're doing is you're tacitly admitting that Allah did not express himself in the best way. Mm -hmm. But don't Muslims also say that Allah is all-wise? Doesn't the verse say Allah is all-wise? Yeah, and, uh, and you, might want to include, you might want to include this one. You're just, he, he claims to be the best of all communicators, right? He's constantly saying how, how, how clear he is. Uh, just, just to, uh, I'm sure those of you who've been following the chat have seen that you had multiple um, Arabic speakers confirm that it says easier here and thus uh thus the literal translation right here is correct and ibn abbas was uh was correct yeah so so muhammad's companion mm -hmm. his cousin whose interpretations of the quran are you know vastly sought after right mm -hmm. i mean ibn abbas was was not a chump uh so so ibn abbas is a heavyweight when it comes to uh, our knowledge of the Quran and early uh, traditions about Muhammad. So even Abbas took for granted that this is the meaning of the word. Didn't even you know try to deal with it by denying its obvious meaning. Rather, what he tried to do was was give the verse an interpretation that would get Allah off the hook. The problem is that his interpretation requires restating what Allah says. Not changing the meaning of the word, but restating it in, in a different argument, right? He, he basically turns it into a different argument. What Allah says in the Quran is, he created things the first time, so reproducing it will be easier for him. He didn't say, if it was hard the first time. That's a conditional statement, right? If it were hard the first time, then it will. the next time it would be easier. No, what he says is, in fact, it was uh, something he did the first time, and it will be easier the second time. Guys, you you, you you getting all that? So <clears throat> Ibn Abbas, who learned the Quran from the man himself. Ibn Abbas learns the Quran from his cousin Muhammad himself. He's the guy who starts Quranics, the field of Quranic studies. He writes his tafsir on the Quran. And he realizes it's very strange to say that resur, you know, res the new creation, resurrecting everything, is easier for Allah than creating it. Because to create it, all he had to do was say B and then created everything. So what, what's going to be easier than that? So Ibn Abbas says, ah, what Allah really means here is that if it had been hard for him to create, which it wasn't, but if it had been, then it would have been easier for him the second time around because he would have learned something. But that's not what Allah is saying. He's just saying if it if it had if it had been hard, then it would be easier this time. Um, and so what Anthony's pointing out is if that's what Allah meant, then Allah once again is a horrible communicator, right? So he's yeah. supposed to be, he's supposed to be picking his words perfectly, and yet the same thing that we have today. Right, the exact same thing that we have today, when we say, "Oh, Allah says in the Quran that if your wife gets out of line, you smack her and you smack and beat her into submission." No, 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 no. What Allah meant there is you you tap her with a toothbrush. That's all He meant there. Okay, well, what, what you're telling me there is He's really, really, really bad at at communication, right? What does Allah mean when He says, um, "Fight those who do not believe in Allah"? Oh, he means fight people who are attacking you. Well, why didn't he say fight those who are attacking you then? Why didn't he say that? Why are you a much better communicator than Allah if that's what he meant? And so... <laughs> because communicating was easier for even a boss. Yeah. <laughs> no, no doubt if Allah had, had a second had, yeah. chance to take a go at it, he'd, yeah. he'd express himself much better. And so, ladies and gentlemen, throughout the Quran, Allah constantly brags about being the best communicator ever. I mean, he had all eternity to get his word perfectly clear. And yet... 
even though he had all eternity to get his words exactly the way he wanted, we ha have his followers constantly having to say what he really meant. And so this isn't just now. It's not just Shabir Ali and Zakir Naik and um, uh, all the other Muslim apologists who are saying what Allah really meant. This goes back to the first generation. You've got Ibn Abbas saying, oh, easier. Oh, that would mean it was harder for him to create the first time. That's not going to make any sense. Well, what Allah really meant was, and then has to add a bunch of words that Allah didn't say, which means, as Anthony pointed out, you're, you're in trouble either way. If you want to take, if you want, if you want to say Allah is perfectly clear and he said exactly what he meant, then he's, he's got some, he's got some problems. He's, he's, he's growing. He seems to be growing in power so that he, or he's learning, he's learning how to do it. And so it's easier to do it a, a second time, but it was harder at the beginning. So you're either stuck with that problem or you can do what Ibn Abbas does and says, uh, well, what he really means is something else, in which case he's not all wise, he's not a great communicator. And in either way, he ends up being not very wise. You know why? Because either he needed even a boss to help him to state it accurately, mm -hmm. or he, uh, you know, so either, either he said that this is easier for him, in which case he's not all powerful, or... He, he needed even a, he still wanted to communicate that he was all powerful, right? Because th yeah. that's part of the point of the verse. He, he's saying that's he's the point. all powerful, yeah. He's saying, right? Yeah, he's saying he can do it every once and then he accidentally. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so either way he shows his, his incompetence. Mm -hmm. and, and this then points up another issue. One thing that people aren't very good at in our day, uh, unless, you know, they're, they're, they're really working at it is being good theological thinkers. I, I mean with respect to theology proper, the doctrine of God. Most people, you know, you know that God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, these sorts of things, but you don't necessarily uh, think through how these attributes of God relate to each other and how tinkering with one attribute would affect everything else. You, you can't just, it's like pulling a thread on, on a garment, you know, it unravels the whole thing. You can't mess with one aspect of God's character without ultimately ending up with something else entirely. And and so if you take into account then the, the, the impression that this verse is giving us, the logical implication of this verse, that Allah's power moves from being uh, weaker to being more powerful, uh, you know, something's harder at one point and easier at another, or his eloquence grows, either way, you're now also saying that Allah is a mutable being, right? Mm -hmm. Allah changes. But that's just huge once you start thinking about it. If, if Allah changes, then it means that he's not uh, absolute, right? He's, he's not uh, the sole determining factor in reality. Something is happening that's affecting Allah. Right, he's not he's not un, unaffected by things. Something's happening that causes Allah to change. So Allah can't say for certain how things are going to be in the future. Right? He, he can't know that because he doesn't have absolute control over everything. He himself has certain things that are harder for him than other things. He is changing uh, in uh, the context of of all this stuff, and so. Just like other mutable beings can become stronger, they also become weaker, right? Uh, people can grow in intelligence, but that intelligence will also start to wane uh, the older they get in, in many cases, right? You get mm -hmm. people whose minds aren't as sharp anymore, or they get Alzheimer's or what have you. Matter of fact, that's brought up here. Yeah. So, so Pony Girl says, well, if Allah was so wise and powerful, why couldn't he get it right the first time? What about all those abrogated verses that Allah have Alzheimer's? And that's really what it seems like, right? Because... When we bring up, or maybe Muhammad is actually the one who's coming up with all this stuff, and he's having some brain farts yeah, or whatever. Uh, he, he's, he's got some. He's, there's definitely a problem going on. But it, it, notice, if we listen to what Muslims say, what they tell us is that the more peaceful revelations that Muhammad was delivering in Mecca, you know, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. That's what Allah really meant. And right there. He meant exactly what he said. And even later, when he was uh, advocating defensive jihad, that if, you know, you, if people are being oppressed or something like that, you have a right to stand up for yourself. There he meant exactly what he said. But towards the end, towards the end of Muhammad receiving revelations, when Allah starts commanding 
Muslims to violently subjugate people and to kill people simply because of their beliefs, fight those who do not believe in Allah, that's when he really didn't mean what he said. He meant something else. And you ask, well, what did he mean when he said fight those who do not believe? Oh, he means fight people if they're attacking and oppressing it. Well, he'd already said that earlier in the Quran. Why do you need to say it again and say it in a way that's completely different from what he said earlier? Especially when he lays down as the proper method of interpretation of interpreting the Quran, the doctrine of abrogation, where later, later commands, if they contradict earlier commands, they cancel those earlier commands. So why did he do that if he knows, if he really knows, oh gosh, I'm about to say this thing in a in a completely different way from the way I said it earlier, even though I mean the same thing. Back then I was clear. Now I'm going to say it. I'm going to mess it up. Uh, but I'm going to say it even though my followers are going to think that I'm actually commanding them to go fight people based on to go fight people based on what they believe. And they're going to think the earlier commands have been abrogated, which is exactly what you find in the commentaries. Exactly what you find in the commentaries. It's these commands to violently subjugate people simply because of their beliefs. They abrogate or cancel earlier revelations. And so Allah just didn't seem to understand the mess he was creating. And if, if Muslims expect us to go along with that and allow them to offer that interpretation, then they're basically telling us that as Allah got older and older, over a period of 23 years, so he aged pretty quickly, he just lost the ability to communicate clearly. And I've, I've actually thought about doing this. I don't know if you, I don't know how much you follow politics, but you got something similar with Joe Biden. That guy used to that guy used to be really sharp and quick-witted. He used to crush people. He used to crush people in debates. Hmm. He was really quick. Now he can't like formulate thoughts and just everyone understands that he's 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 just he's too old and he's losing it. That happens. Ladies and gentlemen, that will most likely happen to pretty much all of us if we live long enough. We start losing we start losing our faculties and so it makes sense with human beings. It makes sense with politicians. Very strange if that's how it happens with uh, if that's what happens with God, but that's what Muslims are telling us. So, yeah, yeah. And so, what all this does really is it exposes the the true origin, right? This stuff is originating in the mind of Muhammad, a pagan, mm -hmm. uh, or at least is uh, you know I'm not excluding the possibility of devilish involvement, uh, but uh, in that case, it's even worse, right? I mean, but it's not coming from God. That's the one thing that's clear. Mm -hmm. If God were communicating, then he would speak in a way that's consistent with his absolute power. He wouldn't be saying this is easier for him as if he's uh, you know, just recently got a gym membership and now can, can bench press twice as much as he used to be able to, to bench press. Mm -hmm. That's how Allah speaks in the Quran. So he exposes that he's not all powerful. He's not all wise because he's trying to say he's all powerful, even if he isn't. But he ends up uh, saying that uh, he, he's not all powerful and uh, he's not even wise enough uh, or as wise as even Abbas. Notice mm -hmm. it's not just that Allah's wisdom isn't perfect and, and still has the potential to, to become greater. Even Abbas expresses it better than Allah did, right? If that's what Allah wanted to say, why was it so easy for even Abbas, but not for Allah? So, so Allah is, is no wiser in, in his choice of, uh, or manner of expressing himself than the cousin of Muhammad, another pagan, by the way. And this all implies that Allah is a mutable, changeable being. Now, here, here's my question. Okay, this, this really already lays out the problem, but I was telling David ab about this earlier. One of the things that I like to do, you know, I, I've often thought, you know, if I, if I didn't pursue the, the, the vocation that I did, uh, and for those that don't know, I... I serve as a, I'm a pastor of uh, prisons. I go into the prisons uh, throughout uh, the state I live in. Uh, so that's what I do vocationally. But if I didn't do that, one thing I would love to do is be a detective. I'd love to try and, you know, figure out cases, especially cold cases. I loved watching the other day uh, when you had... Um, Jay Warner Wallace? Yeah, Jay Warner Wallace on. I, I just remember thinking that's, that was the, that's the coolest job ever. You know, but so what I and David can attest to you that that I, I think this way and have done so on other occasions, and it's led to some some insights with respect to the the development of Islam. But remember how I started out this broadcast? I mentioned that Muhammad often had to be corrected by the Jews. 
So Muhammad's final insights are the product of Jews correcting him. His initial insights were pagan to the core. His better and later insights were often the product of Jewish uh, correction. Okay, and I, and I don't mean here, you know, things like his command to engage in jihad or something like that. I'm talking about his, uh, his better theological insights that are more consistent with monotheism. He never did weed out all of the, the paganism. It's still there. It's all over the place. But the Jews, every step of the way, are just, you know, poking fun at Muhammad. They're, they're putting their fingers on things and Muhammad changing them. So I, I thought to myself, well, why is this problem still here in the Quran? Why did Muhammad never correct this problem? Why don't we ever have a, an account from the Jews? And it's possible that somebody just didn't record something, but I, I'm still thinking, I'm trying to figure out, why isn't there anything uh, indicating that the Jews came along? They were so good at other times, right? Coming along, Muhammad, you're, you're engaging in shirk. You're swearing by a created things. You know, you're associating yourself with Allah when you say, as Allah wills and I will, right? As if you are, are to be coordinated with Allah in, uh, you know, in your will. And, and so this is this is occurring to me, and I start thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe there weren't any Jews left around at the time that Muhammad gave this revelation. Maybe Allah didn't have the foresight to keep the Jews around since they proved to be his greatest teachers, right? If Allah and Muhammad are constantly learning at the feet of the Jews, then it would have made sense for Allah to keep the Jews around. But eventually, Muhammad kills Jews or drives them from Arabia, right? Or he, he kicks them off their land or what have you. So maybe, I'm thinking, maybe there were no Jews around to correct Muhammad. But then I, I hit a snag. And, I, and I, again, I was telling David about this. I hit a snag because if you look at the uh, uh, period of Revelation, where Surah 30 falls, Surah 30 is a Meccan surah, which means it came before his uh, hijra, his uh, migration to Medina. And so that also means that it came before Muhammad uh, waylaid the Jews. But then I did some more digging. I kept digging. What most people don't know is that while, while we classify surahs according to their period of revelation, Right, a surah either comes from the pre-Hijra period and is called a Meccan surah, usually meaning that it was revealed in Mecca, but uh, some of them were, were revealed outside of Mecca, but it's, it's that period when Muhammad still lived in Mecca. Right, The, the post-Hijra surahs are referred to as Medinan surahs. So most people think if you've got a Meccan surah, then the entire surah is from the Meccan period. But that's not actually correct. And I'm not just saying, uh, you know, what, what Christians will say. This, this is what Muslims will tell you. If you pick up a book like uh, Ulum al-Quran, written by Ahmed van Denfer, or any book dealing with the science of Quranic interpretation, uh, Neil Robinson, uh, his book, uh, you know, Interpreting the Quran, or uh, I'm not sure if I'm getting the title exactly right, but he also points this out. Theodore Noldik, who's a, a uh, well-known uh, Orientalist scholar of Islam, numerous, numerous scholars, Muslim and non-Muslim, point out that while it is true that the surahs are classified according to different periods as either Meccan or Medinan, it isn't the case that every single verse in those surahs came exclusively from those periods. In fact, some verses from the later period were added by Muhammad to surahs from the earlier period. Muhammad would say, he'd get a verse and he'd say, okay, put this in that surah. Mm. And that's why, it's one reason why the Quran ends up looking like such a jumbled mess, mm. right? Because you're inserting period uh, uh, sur uh, verses from an entirely different period, smack dab in the middle of uh, an earlier surah, and he didn't even seem to have uh, really good regard for what was going on in the context of that surah. So let me just read something from Ahmed von Denfer real quick, just so you, you see what I'm talking about. So this is a Muslim. This is from his book, Ulum al-Quran, page 89. He says, Many surahs of the Quran do contain material from both periods of revelation, and in some cases there exists difference of opinion among scholars concerning the cl uh, classification of a particular passage. So the surah can be Meccan, while a verse could have come from the Medinan period. 
Now that's just part of the, the puzzle. This uh, here's another statement, and this is this actually brings the, the whole argument full circle. This comes from the study Quran. It's produced by Muslim scholars, and this is found in their footnote on page uh, or on verse 27 of Surah 30. They say all commentators agree that Al Rum, that's Surah 30, was revealed during the Meccan period, although some Muslim scholars maintain that verses 27 and 28 are from the Medinan period. Now, now notice, people, I mean, if, if, if my method here was, was arbitrary, what, what is the likelihood of, of, it, of it answering so exactly to, mm-hmm. to this method that I'm saying was so true of Muhammad in all these other cases? Right? I didn't know ahead of time that this was the answer. I looked at the pattern of, of Muhammad's, you know, his, his method you know, in, in past cases, this final view of Muhammad was a result of Muhammad first teaching stupid paganism, then being corrected by the Jews, and then finally Allah gets a bright idea and, and tells Muhammad, no, 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 Muhammad, let's do it this way. I think the Jews have something there, right? Mm-hmm. So, And by the way, why, why, doesn't, why does Allah not appear to have any better knowledge of the previous scriptures than Muhammad did? Mm-hmm. Right, uh, it's one thing to say that Muhammad was illiterate. Uh, remember, what, what do Muslims say? How does Muhammad know the content of the previous scriptures if uh, he's not receiving revelation from Allah? Right, we're not claiming that Muhammad was quoting uh, the previous scriptures, but he does claim. You know, they, they do say, oh, he's giving the stories of the previous prophets. He's doing all these things. Well, all that all that just reflects the oral culture Muhammad lived in, where he heard and overheard things, and that that's in the Quran as well, right? He ge- he keeps getting accused. You're yeah. just hearing this from these other people, and you're talking to this guy, and that's where you're copying your stories from. Yeah. So so all I'm getting at here is that this is the order of things. Muhammad says something dumb, the Jews correct him, Allah finally learns, and and the and the revelation changes. Okay. So then I see this new problem, which is obviously pagan. What Allah goes from being uh, now, you're, you know, now you're being scientific, right? Yeah. It's, you, now you've got a hypothesis. This is how it works. Therefore, yeah. I've got this situation. Therefore, it should play out like this. And you can you come up with your hypothesis. This is actually going to be not Meccan but Medinan. And then you go, and it's actually confirmed. Yeah, and, and it's surprising too because notice. The, the surah itself turns out to be a Meccan surah. And, I, mm. and I'm thinking, oh, well, that just shoots my theory. So there's got to be some other explanation for this, right? So I keep digging and I find out that certain scholars, these two verses, right, 27 mm. and 28, happen to be the verses that people say came from the Medinan period. I'm thinking, gosh, what are the chances? Uh, it, 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 it's a hypothesis that turns out to be golden. It turns out to be all too true. And this is just the sort of thing that a person would do when they're, you know, trying to investigate something or, you know, not just in science, but, uh, you know, if, if you see, uh, when they, when they try and track down, um, uh, uh, serial killers, Mm -hmm. right. They're looking for patterns. This is how this guy operates. Right. And and that's often how they're able to, to find this person because he's got patterns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so the truly brilliant serial killer would be random, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah. among other things. But, uh, you know, so uh, that's all I did. And, and, and uh, so this problem shows Allah is not all-powerful. He's not all-wise. He's not immutable. And therefore, his promises can't be trusted. Right? It, it, Allah can't be trusted in his promises. The very verse where he's promising to resurrect things ends up being a verse where he exposes himself as the very opposite of what he claims to be in the verse. He claims to be all-powerful and all-wise. He turns out to be neither of those, and he's also not immutable. And there, there's not a good reason to think he's going to become wiser in the future rather no. than... than uh, the, you no, know. He's only, if he's getting worse. Yeah, and, but the, worse Jews, the yes. Jews aren't around, so, yeah. so <laughs> what are his chances? Yep, he's in all kinds of trouble. All right, uh, take a few comments here. He should have waited um, until he got his doctorate. Take a, we'll take a few comments here, and then Anthony can go ahead and summarize everything and make sure you got that. So anyway, the, the, the key point is check that verse, um, go through some translations, look at some translations like Halali Khan, 
Um, Pictal, they, they give the translation as easier and learn to make that point. Uh, Jason here says, if Allah is all powerful and all knowing, then why he says the gospel has been corrupted. Allah cannot save his holy scripture. Uh, Jason, you've been getting your information about the Quran from Muslims who that's not what the Quran says. There's nowhere that Allah says that the gospel has been corrupted. That's what Muslims say. Um, but notice, notice how this really brings to the surface the same kind of issue, right? If Allah was trying to say that the gospel has been corrupted, and instead he keeps saying no one can change his words, we still have to judge by the gospel, we still have the gospel, we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the gospel, then once again he is a horrible, horrible, horrible communicator. He's a horrible communicator who can't say what he actually means, and Muslims need to come along and rescue him and say what he really meant. Or, <laughs> or if he were saying that it's been corrupted, well, guess what? Then he couldn't protect his word, and so he's got a problem with his power. So no matter what the situation is, if Muslims are right, and Allah just, uh, you know, he 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 couldn't he couldn't uh, he couldn't protect the word, then they've got a problem. If Allah couldn't communicate what he actually means, then he's got a problem. Um, if we're right. If we're right and Allah does nothing but affirm the inspiration and preservation and authority of the gospel and yet contradicts the gospel, then you still got a pro he's still got a problem with ignorance. He doesn't know what's in the book. So Allah would be illiterate like his prophet. Wouldn't that be coincidence? <laughs> if this book that's delivered by an illiterate prophet also has a God who's illiterate and just doesn't know what's in any of these scriptures, that'd be that'd be pretty pretty amazing coincidence there unless we conclude that Muhammad is the real source of the revelations. Yeah, and notice uh, just 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 one aspect of this. I, I was thinking about this the other day. I, uh, you know that the the Quran claims that prophets were sent to every nation. Now, mm -hmm. some Muslims will break these things down differently. Some make a major distinction between prophet and uh, messenger, or apostle and prophet, or messenger. Uh, you know the the difference between the term uh, Rasul and Nabi. Some will say that uh, you know one refers to somebody who receives inspiration. The other one refers to somebody who receives inspiration and a book or a scripture. In any case, according to Muslims, it's not just the gospel that was sent previously. There were many books that were sent before. We have certain books that are named. Mm -hmm. You have a book that was supposedly sent down to Abraham, a book that was sent to Moses, a book that was sent to David, uh, and a book that was sent to Jesus. And those are just representative samples of the books that were sent. We can assume there were a great many other books sent to people uh, besides, right? If there's 124,000 prophets sent to all these different nations so that they would know Allah, and according to the Quran, the reason these revelations are given is so that people will recognize Muhammad and confirm his, him as a prophet when he comes, right? That's the stated reason why these things are being given, right? So notice, I mean, to me, this is just incredible to think that Allah... His intention in giving these revelations, in fact, he even makes the prophets swear they're going to, uh, you know, this is this is their whole, you know, reason uh, for for being, right? That they're, they're to support him, to affirm him, to, to point to him, right? So if, if Allah does all of this, but then lets those things become corrupted before Muhammad ever comes on the scene... How, how incredibly incompetent, right? It's like... Pretty incompetent. Yeah, he, but but notice how often he's incompetent. He, his track record of, of, of accomplishing preservation, which he claims he's going to do for the Quran, mm -hmm. is a whopping zero, or mm -hmm. uh, he, he has a 100% failure rate, mm -hmm. right? H how incompetent is that? Yeah. Maybe it was easier for him to protect <laughs> the Quran. Yeah, by that point, he's like, gosh, I realize how I blew it there. I blew it he there. He learned his lesson. Yeah. Satan cut me off at the pass there. Those those dirty Jews, they, you know, they, they un, underhandedly, you know. Yeah. Uh, so so 124,000 prophets that Allah spoke to and through, and however many books, all got corrupted. Muhammad, uh, Allah has a 100% failure rate. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of a more incompetent deity. No. Zeus. His, uh, his, Allah's incompetence is on one million, <laughs> right? He's like Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan God level uh, with the with the incompetence. Yeah. All right. Um, this is a totally different topic, but uh, 
Brothers, what can I say to a Muslim who says that I am rude for talking bad about his prophet and his beliefs when my hope is for him to come to Christ? Well, you just, you don't, don't let Muslims get away with that, right? I mean, it's different if you're in a Muslim country where they'll, you know, they could actually kill you for talking about Muhammad or get you arrested or something like that on blasphemy charges. Don't, don't, don't do that there. Let us, let us do, let us speak to them through the internet. But if you're in a place where um, you have the freedom to talk to people and you're protected, your speech is protected by the law, um, you say whatever you want about Muhammad. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to be a jerk about it. You can get the same information across. In fact, I have a video um, it's called um, How to Share Unpleasant Facts with Pleasant Muslims, right? So unpleasant facts about Islam with, with, with pleasant Muslims. And what I mean there is, you know, you can run right up to someone and say, hey, your prophet had sex with a nine-year-old girl. What a pervert, right? But you could present that same information in a way that, that's more likely to keep the conversation going. So, you, you know, you could say, hey, you know, you told me that, that Muhammad is the greatest man ever. And I was looking at some of your sources and here's some of the stuff I, I found. I was wondering, could you tell me what you think about this? It's much more likely that you're going to get information across like that. So I would encourage that. But if someone is just saying you you shouldn't bring up any information that's critical of my prophet, you gotta cut you you gotta you gotta step in at that point. I would encourage you to learn a few things about the Quran and Islam because if the person says, uh, you 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 I'm not talking to you because you say mean things about my beliefs and my prophet. You say, okay, is that wrong? Is it immoral to criticize someone in that way? And if the person says yes, then you could just go, okay, well, you know, Surah 98 verse 6 says that Jews and Christians are the worst of creatures. So you just condemned your own God, right? Do you, do you understand how you condemned your own God there? Um, you, you can, of course, go to passages which talk about actually fighting and subjugating Jews and Christians because of our beliefs. And so you point out, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing way less than your God orders you to do. Your God orders you, when you whenever you get the chance to subjugate me or to kill me, make to force me to pay you or you kill me. Um, so, so I mean, if you have a problem with me simply speaking, you got some, you got some issues. You, your, your pro, your God and your prophet say to do way worse. Um, but if you want, and it's good to learn, uh, you know, some of these passages. This is a passage from the history of Al Tabari. So, the history of Al Tabari. One of Muhammad's companions was asked about what was the worst, what, what was the worst treatment he ever received from the Quraysh. So it's the history of At-Tabari, volume 6, pages 101 to 102. Watch, watch how Muhammad was. What was the worst attack you saw by the Quraysh upon the messenger of God when they openly showed their enmity to him? He replied, I was with them when their nobles assembled one day in the Hijr and discussed the messenger of God. <clears throat> they said, we have never seen the like of what we have endured from this man. He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, and insulted our gods. We have endured a great deal from him. Notice what how Muhammad interacted with the pagans of his own tribe. He derided their values, abused their forefathers, reviled their religion, caused division among us, and insulted their gods. So if your friend thinks it's wrong and immoral to do that sort of thing, great. He just condemned his own prophet. And you can ask, why do you, why, why are you so hypocritical? Your prophet's going around doing way worse than me simply talking about your prophet. And yet that you think it's perfectly fine. So do you think there are two different standards is what you asked. So are you telling me there's two different standards that I have to sit here and your religion can constantly attack and insult me and my beliefs. And I just have to keep my mouth shut. Whereas I'm not allowed to so much as question anything you say, because it sounds like you're advocating for some sort of system where you're superior and everyone else is inferior and everyone has to do what you want them to do. And, and that's, that's telling me a lot about your religion, actually. And I, that's making me very, very concerned about your religion. So I'd go about it. I'd go about it that way. But yeah, don't don't let don't let people get away with it if they're telling you you don't get to talk about Muhammad. People have been Muslims have gotten away with that for 14 centuries because Muslims were generally in a in a certain part of the world and they would chop your head off if, for criticizing Muhammad. We're not in that position here. So they need to understand you guys don't get to continue operating by those rules where we have to keep our mouths shut about your prophet. You have the most obvious false prophet in history. He did some of the sickest, stupidest stuff I've ever even heard of anyone doing. And if anyone deserves to be mocked, it's your prophet. So just, you need to take it. You need a man up. You need a man up. If your prophet didn't want us making fun of him, he shouldn't have done all the horrible stuff he did. All right. 
Anything you wanted to? Uh, you have any no, thoughts on that? No, no. I think you covered it. I think you covered it. All right. Well, um, I guess we could. Hmm. We should probably uh, should probably check the super chats over here. All right, guys. We're gonna check the super chats. We're gonna respond to the super chats, and then we're gonna cut out. But we should be back tomorrow night, right? Yeah, we'll be back. We'll be we'll be back live again tomorrow night. In fact, if you guys have a specific topic that you'd like us to cover for tomorrow, let us know. Not in the chat because we're not. We, we, I'll check the comments later. So after after this is over, leave a comment in the comments if you got a specific uh, topic you'd like us to address tomorrow, and we'll check it out. Uh, all right, let's check out some of the super chats. Um, probably won't get through all of these because we got work to do. We're here to work, not sit around doing nothing, which is what Anthony's trying to do. He's trying to just go live the entire time. Marilyn Murphy says, if Allah is the best of deceivers, then no one in their right mind would pay heed to anything he says. Yeah, uh, and but believe it or not, some of the early Muslims started to realize that, right? So they realized that you've got Allah in the Quran constantly bragging about being the best of deceivers. And so the result was that Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion, said, if I had one foot in paradise, I would still fear Allah's deception. Notice, he that was someone who realized what sort of God he's serving. He's serving an omnipotent deceiver. And that means that that deceiver could be lying and tricking you about anything, even going to paradise. He could just be tricking you. Notice, Abu Bakr was one of the few people who were guaranteed to go to paradise by Muhammad himself. So Abu Bakr was thinking, Abu, uh, Allah might even be deceiving me through Muhammad. And so that he that's someone who finally understood what sort of God he was dealing with. So yeah, certainly certainly difficult to, uh, to trust a God who's like that. And notice, notice the incredible epistemological problem that creates. Just take the verse we were thinking of, mm -hmm. Surah 30, 27. We've pointed out that it's a problem. It exposes that Allah is not omnipotent, omniscient, and immutable, right? He doesn't have all power, isn't all wise, isn't unchanging. But maybe that incompetence and everything else is a part of Allah's trick, right? Maybe he, maybe he you know, wants to communicate that. Mm -hmm. in, in which case, I mean, I, that's not a better position, uh, for things to be in. But, but my point is it just throws everything into this incredible uh, confusion, right? You can't tell if his blunder is really intentional, uh, you know, or so when is he telling the truth or not telling the truth? That's just never going to be a, a possibility you can see through. If Allah is an omnipotent deceiver, but, uh, you know, the other thing is, I mean, I, he, he boasts about being the greatest deceiver, but I don't know how if he even pulls that off, uh, you know, the, the best, because, again, he's trying in this verse to say that he is all-powerful, mm -hmm. but he ends up saying he's not, mm -hmm. right? So he's not a he's not the best deceiver. He ends up, I mean, he might be uh, the most willing to deceive, uh, the most desperate, uh, the most anxious to deceive. He might sincerely want to be the best. But I, I think he proves himself pretty incompetent because he blows it all the time. Yeah, who blows it more often than Allah? Yeah, he is. Uh, he is pretty bad. I actually want to. Uh, I've got a uh, for Ramadan. I've, I've basically I'm basically getting all these comments of Muslims just pretty much begging me to stop going after their God. It's like too late, guys. Too late. You could have. You could have. You could have been nice earlier on. Uh, you know, years ago, but you don't get to start begging just when I start. You know, finally, just completely wrecking your profit on a on a daily basis. But um, they're asking what what my problem is, and one of the things I want to say is, you know, I open up your Quran and it says uh, it says Allah's the best of deceivers, and I think, okay, that makes that that makes sense. But then Muslims tell me it actually means best of plotters. He's the best. Of, he's the best of people who plot. Right. And see, that's why he annoys me. And that's why I got to come after him because he's not the best of plotters. I'm the best of plotters. He's trying to steal my thunder. Right. You got to understand. You Muslims who are running around saying Allah is the best of plotters. No, he's not. Look at look at how much look at how much I wreck him. <laughs> come on. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Eric Brown says I was taking a nap. I started reading it. I might as well finish. He said, I was taking a nap, but, uh, but I woke up to a sound, the sound of Allah being bent over and spanked by D. Wood and Anthony. <laughs> Love you guys. God bless. Mm. We got Cheryl R. and Apple so, Goo with the uh, super stickers. 
So, so this, this, this reminds me, I was talking with some people the other day about Martin Luther. Mm-hmm. And if you know anything about Luther, he was a guy who had incredible wit. In fact, I think you'd, you'd he love was reading, savage. Yeah, you'd love reading certain things. And he was just witty all around, witty when it came to any subject. So if he was ridiculing a, a stupid belief, you know, one of the things that really irked Luther was the sale of indulgences. He thought that uh, that uh, corrupt people were preying upon poor souls, right? And and trying, you know, there, uh, Tetzel was going around, Johann Tetzel going around Germany and other places, trying to sell forgiveness, sell time off in purgatory, and he would he would come up with these jingles like. Uh, uh, you know, every time uh, a coin in the pitcher rings, a soul from purgatory springs. That's, it's one of the catchy tunes that he would sing, mm-hmm. and and Luther switched that up. You know, he says every you know every coin in the pitcher, the Pope gets richer and richer. <laughs> but uh, but Luther, uh, there's this quote that always sticks with me, and that that comment just reminded me of it. Luther, whenever he was sick, he always thought he was going to die, uh-huh. right? So he said. Uh, he said uh, one of the. And I hope everybody is is they've, they've got their ears ready. Uh, this is not too crude, but it's it's a little graphic as it, in, in the description. But he said uh, he says the world is like a gig. Uh, he says I am like a ripe stool, and the world is like a gigantic anus, and we are about to depart, or it's uh, something <laughs> I'm about to depart. <laughs> yeah, it's about to let me loose, or something. <laughs> it's about to shoot me out. <laughs> The Earth's about to roll some logs. <laughs> the Earth's about to heave a Havana. Um, <laughs> Nick Tam said, uh, uh, as Surah 2, 106 is about abrogation, how can anyone be sure about the Quran being fully correct with the tablet in heaven? Maybe it has already been abrogated. Any thoughts on that? Well, supposedly the doctrine of abrogation refers to commands. So... Uh, and the, the, the problem here is some of the commands that were abrogated were taken out of the Quran. Like Muslims will say that the command to breastfeed um, grown men uh, in order to do away with any sort of sexual attraction between the man and the woman, uh, that that was abrogated and that's why it was taken out. Well, you've got other verses in the Quran which were abrogated and they're still in the Quran. So who's deciding which gets taken out of the, which abrogated verses get taken out of the Quran and which abrogated verses stay in the Quran? And notice if, if you have abrogated verses that are taken out of the Quran, then the Quran that we have right now does not match the eternal Quran, the one, the, the tablet in heaven. So Muslims have a defective uh, copy of that. And you'd have to say that the eternal Quran in heaven, the eternal tablet, which has which has all the the abrogated verses in it, it's it, it's it's a it's a copy of the Quran that just contains uh, contradictions. It, it contains contradictory commands telling you different things to do. So it once again, it's a problem no matter what you do, no matter which direction you go, you got a problem. Yeah. One other thing, although when Muslims try to define the doctrine of abrogation, you, you might have noticed that David stated it technically. He says, in theory, mm-hmm. it's only commands that are abrogated. And the mm-hmm. reason he stressed that, although he wasn't, you know, the point wasn't to go into that, but you stress that because you know as well as I do that it also affects doctrinal issues. Yep. So they claim that it's just him changing commands because it sounds better to say that Allah changed what was required at one time uh, as opposed to another than it does to and, say... And, 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 that, and that would make sense. You're a person in this in these circumstances. Yeah. Uh, in, you're, you're a person in these circumstances. And so later people who are in different circumstances, I can always change the rule for them. But it doesn't make sense if he's changing historical claims yeah. or theological claims or something like that, which aren't, which aren't based on that. And so it's got to be commands and yet it's not, it's not commands. Yeah. It's not just commands. And it's, so all, even, it's all kinds of stuff. Even in the area of commands, you can see how some commands, but just like we do with our children, right? Like uh, maybe when they're younger, we mm-hmm. say they have to be in at five, right? Uh, before mm-hmm. it gets dark. And then as they get older, they get more privileges. And, th- and that has to do with issues of maturity and, safety and I mean just all sorts of issues right mm-hmm. it's not that that the morality of something is changing it's other yeah. factors that make this now an okay situation but it's not like Allah can say murder is okay at one time and not at another without that being a problem because now you're talking about fundamental morality here right but in fact even the commands involve 
theological or doctrinal issues. You just can't escape it. For example, uh, you, one of the things you have, if you don't have a doctrine of abrogation, you have contradictions in the Quran, more, more than you already have, right? right? You have to have a doctrine of abrogation or mm -hmm. else you're left with all these contradictions. Mm -hmm. So, and wait, but by the way, side note, what's funny is if you look at the historical background mm -hmm. of the verses on abrogation, it's that people started making fun of Muhammad for, yeah. for changing his revelations. So Muhammad's, Muhammad's getting these revelations and they're changing and people eventually start start noticing and they actually are making fun of the Muslims saying, your prophet, your prophet says one thing and then the next day tells you something else. What a joke. And that's when the revelation comes down. Oh yes, I got a revelation. The revelation is saying that Allah can change his revelations because he, he keeps bringing better stuff. Just keeps bringing something better to replace it. And so, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so one thing I'm thinking of is in Surah 4 and I have, uh, I want to do a video on this tomorrow or whenever we do it but uh, uh in, in surah 4 you have a statement one of the things is incredible because of the the method of compiling the quran and how muhammad did things a lot of times the verse that's uh sometimes when when one verse abrogates something it's found in an entirely different surah mm -hmm. other times it's found in the same surah sometimes it's found in a verse prior to the verse that's being abrogated no. it just results in this incredible confusion so in surah 4 though as an example you have one verse saying uh, that Allah won't forgive people who delay repentance until death, right? Meaning they wait until they're about to die and then they repent. So that's unforgivable, delayed repentance. The other thing it says is it's it's unforgivable uh, if, if, uh, if a person uh, is a disbeliever, dies as a disbeliever. But then later Allah says that what he won't forgive, what's unforgivable is shirk, right? But he'll forgive anything that's less than that. But that's in the same surah, surah 4. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's three verses that, that do this. Mm -hmm. You end up having three verses contradicting each other. Uh, but uh, in, in Islamic theological categories, or excuse me, legal categories, they actually distinguish between disbelief and shirk. Disbelief is not as great as shirk. Disbelief just means mm -hmm. you know, you're know you not believing the right mm -hmm. thing. Shirk is positively ascribing partners to Allah. So here you have uh, a change, Allah going from saying these two things are unforgivable to saying this one thing is unforgivable. But notice what it involves. It involves issues of theology, right? It, it's not like these are theologically neutral things, which, which assumes that theology has somehow changed. But how, how can that be, right? Unless, unless the underlying theology changes, Allah changes or something like that. You, you really can't keep that sort of thing up. And Muhammad certainly didn't do it with any consistency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because Allah is not all wise. Allah's got some issues here. Um, David Melnick says, uh, Hey David, been watching you and Nabil since late 2015 when I got saved and was a missionary in Bangladesh for half a year. Keep up the great work. Wait, you got saved when you were a missionary in Bangladesh? I must be reading that wrong. I'm guessing. <laughs> oh, I think you're saying you got saved in 2015 and then you uh, ended up as a missionary in Bangladesh. Unless you're just saying, hey, I went off to be a missionary in Bangladesh and then you know, I didn't really know the gospel and then I got saved. There's, a, uh, there's an old story of a famous Puritan who, and if you know anything about Puritans, they were pretty rigorous, you know, their, their logical analysis of things and they're, uh, they were powerful in their preaching and so forth. Sometimes they get a bad rap. Some were, you know, a little, you know, extreme, but uh, there's a story of this uh, preacher who he prepares his sermon, and while he while he preaches it, he's converted. He, you know, he, he actually mm -hmm. records that he was converted uh, through his own preaching. <laughs> it's like it suddenly hit him what he's talking about. That, <laughs> that's funny. It's, it's like a uh, Dan Wallace taught himself oh, Greek. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, from his own book. Yeah, from his own books. Yeah, guys. Uh, Dan, he had an Allah moment. Yeah, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> Matter of fact, that might be a good uh, a good video. Him, uh, Dan Wallace, and Allah. So Dan Wallace is a is a famous uh, Greek New Testament scholar, and he had learned Greek until he was the one writing the textbooks on New Testament Greek, and then he had some sort of uh, brain infection that wiped out his memories of certain types of things. And one, he just completely lost all his knowledge of Greek. So he used his own books to teach himself Greek again, and then became, you know, the. Uh, uh, that's incredible to me. Yeah. He 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 became a Greek scholar twice. Now, mm -hmm. maybe there were some. Uh, he he probably had a aptitude. natural ability. Yeah, probably has yeah. good natural ability. But still, for that's that's just incredible to it's me. Impressive. I I you know they used his uh, textbook, one of the textbooks we used for Greek in seminary, 
and I, I read it all the time because it, you know, just it takes a while to get certain things down. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, here's this guy who has mastered it, the language twice, and I have to keep reading and rereading and rereading his stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And I'm just sort of like incrementally moving along with things, whereas he has, you know, bit the whole thing off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rachel Diaz says, I'm a Christian. I'm going to look into buying a Quran. Which one is the best translation? Which one would you guys recommend? Thank you for your work. That's going to depend, Rachel. If you're interested in apologetics dealing with Islam, I would not recommend starting with the Quran. And the reason is I've seen too many people give up. <laughs> <laughs> the Quran is just too boring. It's too hard to read, and so they give up studying. Uh, if you're if you if you want to learn apologetics, I would recommend studying topically, right? So, uh, pick a topic like when something you're interested in. You know, if you want to look up all the Quran passages that talk about Jesus or something like that, or um, yeah, or if you were interested in refuting jihad or something like that, look up all the Quran passages on that because it's just a big mess. It's a big, hard, difficult un to understand mess. So I would recommend studying, uh, reading a couple books and studying it topically, and then somewhere down the road, read the Quran all the way through. But if you just want to, if, if you want to read the Quran, you're wondering, you know, wh which Quran to get, th that's going to depend as well. Um, the easiest Quran I've ever had to read was the, um, it's by someone named Halim. His last name is Halim. I forget his first uh, name. Abdel Halim. Abdel Halim. Yeah, but he, uh, that's the Oxford version. So if you type in Oxford Quran, the Halim translation is what comes up. And it's basically the guy just knew Arabic well and English very well. You have lots of people who don't know one or the other as well, right? So they, 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 they kind of know English and they're translating, but they clearly don't have a great grasp on the English language. Uh, Halim is just the easiest to read, so you might want to go with that if you're just trying to get through it. Um, if you want something that's not watered down, you might want to get something like the Hillel Khan. Of course, you're going to have problems with any English translation, but you might want something like the Hillel Khan, which is put out by Salafis. If you want a popular version, um, Yusuf Ali is a really popular edition, so yeah, kind of depends on what you're kind of depends on what you're looking for. I, I've always found Yusuf Ali very helpful because he actually did have a good uh, command of uh, Arabic and English. I think of it's course, garbage. <laughs> well, but I, I think he improves the Quran a great deal. If you read the footnotes, and this is mm -hmm. what I really valued and found useful, because his footnotes, especially the older ones, I hear they've revised some, and it's harder to get some of the older stuff. Yeah. Uh, but his footnotes are often devastating. They are. Oh, no, they're they're massively helpful. Yeah, yeah. So footnotes are awesome. He's not trying to. His footnote on sixty one fourteen. Oh, where, yeah. where the, yeah. the, the where it's he's talking about the Romans. Yeah, awesome yeah. stuff. Oh yeah. So so he's got a lot of useful material. He's not trying to help Christians uh, or you know he's he's trying to you know be a Muslim, but but he's got these footnotes that are really helpful. So I always liked Yusuf Ali, but even his translation is not perfect. One thing that shows you just how terrible the Quran is is you mentioned the Halali Khan version. You've seen all the words in brackets. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty rough. In fact, there's a, there's a funny story here. Um, uh, in uh, in the Bible, sometimes you'll see uh, words that are in parentheses, and that just means that those that's a parenthetical thought that was in the text. Right, mm -hmm. the author wrote those words. Yeah. Right. But Muslims, when they read translations of the Quran, there are all these words in brackets or parentheses. And it doesn't mean that those words are part of the Quran, but are a parenthetical aside of the author. It, that's something that's being added by the uh, translator because the Quran is otherwise unintelligible gibberish, right? Mm -hmm. So I actually know uh, of a Muslim, I won't even mention his name, but he's somebody you've interacted with, you've debated. And he wrote these articles one time uh, where he was uh, he was criticizing certain translations because it had words in parentheses. He thought they were being added, and so he mm -hmm. came along and saying, "You guys are adding this to yeah. you know." And I just busted out laughing because I'm thinking, "Oh, he's confused the convention for what Arab translators do with the Quran with with what's happening in the Bible." Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not adding words. I mean, there are. It, there are language differences that sometimes account for having having to add, you know, like like a word just because 
one language doesn't require it and another language does mm -hmm. to express the same thought. But that's not really adding to it, mm -hmm. right? That's just yeah. like, you don't always have to use the verb to be in English, for example. Anybody reading it, in fact, I was working with my son on Latin the other day, and I'm not proficient in Latin, but uh, you know, I had a little bit of Latin, so I, I'm trying to get him started, and then mm -hmm. I'm going to hand him off to somebody who's more competent than me. But we were running across these 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 lines in Latin, and I'm thinking, wait, where's the verb at? Mm -hmm. and, and then I realize you don't. It doesn't. They have a verb in, in in Latin, but it's not required in every sentence. Native Latin speakers will realize where where that's happening. Uh, so if you express it in English, though, you're going to have to put the verb in there. Uh, is or whatever you know uh, John is tall or something so uh, but in the Quran you get uh, you get entire phrases and, and sentences yeah. and, and all this other stuff because and, and it's a couple <laughs> kinds one is one it's 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 as you point out, it's just in, incoherent you can't make sense of it without adding all these extra words but then you have these uh, moral changes right like mm -hmm. like like Surah four, yeah <laughs> Surah 4 verse 34 says beat them and so Yusuf Ali puts in parentheses lightly. Just, just to be clear, you want to beat them lightly. Yeah, yeah. So so lightly that it leaves a, a you know their their skin turns green. No, yeah. it's okay if their skin turns green. Just <laughs> just uh, make sure you don't beat them more uh, than that. One thing I saw the other day, I, I was looking at a, a commentary on Surah Four, and uh, the, the commentator was trying to account for it and of course they also have to add by the way that this is stages yeah it doesn't literally express no, it that this is yeah. and and in fact if it, if it has to be stages then you could condemn muhammad because when aisha got out of line he went and pop hit, popped yeah. her right in the chest he didn't and, uh, warn her and then banish her to a separate and bed. by the way have you ever thought about this is kind of a, an aside but it, have you ever thought about what was going on i mean you know the the details of it is that he goes out and, and then yeah. she follows him but, but he's why supposedly she... praying for you know relief from the punishment of the grave for someone. But yeah, there there is the issue of she doesn't trust this dude. Yeah, <laughs> she doesn't trust that, this that, dude. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. She she's like, you know, what's he up to? Yeah. And by the way, you, you just brought up another. Uh, this is another thing that Muhammad learned from the Jews. One day, I don't have the hadith in front of me, but one day a Jew, uh, Jewess, a Jewish woman, mm -hmm. was talking with Aisha. And during the conversation, uh, as they're parting, the Jewish woman kind of, you know, blesses her in, in, a, in a certain way. She says, may Allah protect you from the punishment of the grave, meaning may your time in the grave be, be you know, peaceful. And, and it says, the, the Hadith says that Aisha was frightened. Hmm. So Muhammad comes in and Aisha asks him about it. And she says, is there punishment in the grave? And he goes, no, there isn't. Who told you that? Basically. And then Muhammad goes out, and guess what? He I mean, basically, you can figure out what's happening. He has to go ask somebody about this. He, he's probably going out and, and, and you know, uh, learning from a Jewish person. But in any case, the Jewish person told Aisha. She asked Muhammad. He he uh, says no, and then later he comes back and says, "Allah just told me there is punishment in the grave." <laughs> that, that's not all Allah uh, told him. Allah would eventually reveal that most. <laughs> Most of the punishment of the grave is for urinating you're, improper, yeah, you're, improperly. You're yeah. being wrong, right? And Not because you went and killed a bunch of people, or you massacred a bunch of people, or you molested yeah. a girl. Any, none of that. You just were not peeing properly. You have to do the proper Muhammad position where you squat while peeing and stuff like that. And then so, other than that. So, so you know what's funny is, so you've got all these hadiths who, where uh, it says that Aisha says, I uh, after that, I never uh, noticed... Or, uh, she states it kind of odd, but it's almost like a devil negative. But but she says it, he never stopped praying for, for the punishment of the grave, right? Like this became an obsession of mm -hmm. his. You also have a bunch of hadith where it says that he, you know, he heard Moses in his grave. He heard this person in his grave. He would walk by and hear yeah. Jews screaming. Yeah, he could uh, walk by graves grave. and hear them. Yeah. But, but, but notice, why wasn't he hearing them before, right? Yeah, he suddenly gained it, the ability. Uh, yes. He's like a lot. <laughs> He's gaining abilities as he goes along. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier for him. A Jewish woman tells him. Now, now notice this. You've got another link in the chain here. Okay, Muslims say it's Allah, then Muhammad, then his companions and other people who are getting it. I, I said earlier that no, it's the Jews, then it's Muhammad, then it's Allah. Allah's always last, Muhammad's in the middle. But now we've got Aisha in here, mm -hmm. right? It's the Jews, Aisha, Muhammad, now Allah. So Allah's third in line. Uh, mm -hmm. so he's getting further behind. He's Maybe his intelligence is... Uh, it's getting uh, it's getting rough. 
Abhishek Infinity said, David, please cover the topic Takia. I actually uh, have covered that. Uh, if you look at my three stages of jihad, I cover it there. I also have a video titled, What is Takia? And for a while, for a while, it was funny. Uh, that was the, that video would be at the top of Google searches. If you, if you did a Google search for Takia or what is Takia, my video would pop up there at the beginning. I guess some people complained along the way. And uh, I don't think it's like that anymore. But yeah, I've got a video. But yes, I am planning on making another video about Takia because I saw a video by, uh, he's one of the internet atheists, uh, genetically modified skeptic. I'd never seen one of his videos before, hmm. but I guess it came to me because it was an Islamic topic. I guess it came up to me as a recommendation, but he was explaining Takia and he makes an important point. He gets a little bit right, but he, he he's he's messing up so hmm. probably gonna sit, make a video titled something like what genetically modified skeptic gets right and wrong about takia so i'll have to clarify that um again um all right we got to cut out here but uh, a couple more uh super chat comments riaz koreshi says more boom boom room please thank you you guys are the best greg c with the super sticker Gerhard peter said uh hey david here's my project that i started to gather comments of muslims leaving islam from your YouTube videos, uh, David helps David helps Muslims uh, Welcome your feedback. So apparently, Gerhardt is collecting um, comments about Muslims who are leaving Islam after watching my videos. And uh, I, I pointed out I pointed out in a recent video that I used to do that. I used to take screenshots of the Mus of, of the comments from Muslims who had left Islam and either become Christians or atheists. Usually, they usually become Christians or atheists or agnostics, something like that. Um, so I take pictures of them and, and, and post them, but it's just too time consuming to go through all of the, uh, all of the, the comments. So a couple days ago I posted, I don't know, 10 or so, um, that were just, you know, I just went through, I just went through the comments on a couple recent videos and, and took screenshots. But, uh, yeah. So, um, a lot of people were saying it's really, they're basically saying it, you need to do it anyway, David, because it's so encouraging to see how many Muslims are leaving Islam. So they're kind of telling me dedicate the time to it anyway but i just don't have the time to go through all the comments so it's cool it's cool if that's what uh, uh it's cool if that's what uh, you know other people want to do but i will occasionally i will occasionally post a, a you know you know post eight or ten or so something like that when i see a bunch at once i'll just take a bunch of screenshots and and uh and share those all right well we had uh we had more a lot more super chats um but we need to get off here because we have we have some work to to get to and so we're going to get to it. Should have another video up tomorrow. We'll be recording Anthony. And Lord willing, we will be live again. Again, share your comments in the comments section on what you'd like to like us to cover tomorrow. We'll try to pick out, try to pick a good one. Uh, any final thoughts, Anthony? Uh, no, no. I, uh, I mean, I was going to say real quick, though, when you do those videos, I think it's helpful also in addressing the people who criticize the the method right of using mockery where it's appropriate wit mm -hmm. and so forth that's what often gets many muslims to listen it ropes them in mm -hmm. that's what that, that's what hooks them mm -hmm. right and then they end up saying that themselves right yep. uh, so uh, cuz i yeah, you remember they, that, they say i was mad at you at first but then <laughs> yeah you remember that years ago i you know i was talking with somebody that was that was criticizing your method yeah and, and they oh, were <laughs> they were opposing they were opposing it with with somebody else they used somebody else as an example and said look at the way this person does it right and I, I said, well, you know, how does that prove this method better? All you're doing is saying he does it differently, right? Uh, but you're saying that what he's doing is wrong. I, mean, I nobody, We don't have any criticism of this over here, right, how this is being done. But but what you're doing is you're saying there, there are two different methods, you know, but it's just arbitrary to say this one's right and, and this one isn't, right, unless mm -hmm. you've got some reason. And then his, his reasoning was, well, uh, you know, people like this guy, and I'm thinking... Well, that's not a very good reason, yeah. right? Right. That, I mean, that uh, our, our goal isn't to be liked, and Jesus wasn't liked by a lot of people. So, what if mm -hmm. we take this person and set him next to Jesus? Now, now, what are you going to say, right? You're, yeah. you're going to say this person's method's better than Jesus, who ended up being crucified, mm -hmm. and then the person oh said no, 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 of course not. So then, what they tried uh, to say is uh, this person's method is more effective. Uh, you know, it, it, it or he didn't say. He didn't make that claim exactly, but what he said is this one, uh, you know, is is basically 
orchestrated, you know, it will, that's what it will result in, right? It'll be more effective. And I said, well, that's the case. And you got to account for why David's got, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. He he has millions and millions of views. This is this is catching people's attention. Nobody's watching this for some mm-hmm. reason, right? Yeah, I, w- but, I always I always invite people. I say if you think you've got a better way of doing it, because I think you can have all kinds of different ways of doing stuff. Because there are all kinds of different you know, different kinds of Muslims. But um, if you really think, oh, David, you know, if you did it this way, then it would be so much better. My my response is usually, well, go do it that way. Yeah. Then yeah. come back. Then come back when you can say you see how how well this works. Yeah. And, and you're not going to say if if they have less numbers, you know, of people saying they converted or whatever, or if they have more, you're not going to, you know, your response will be praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> you know, there, there's sarcasm, there's wit, yeah. there's all, there's all this other stuff that yeah, you my, do. Yeah, but, my, but at yeah, the end my, of the day, you're my, not going to be yeah, like. Yeah, my only thought is if you say my way is because I don't go around doing that. I don't. I don't yeah. go around to people saying you're you're you need to do it my way. I I tell most people don't do it my way, right? Yeah. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so I don't go around telling everyone else they need to they need to do it my way. But when you specifically say, David, you're doing it wrong. Here's a better way to do it. I want to know what your evidence is for thinking that that is an actual better right. way. And they never have they never have any any basis for saying it. Yeah. So so what this person did was first of all he tried to to point to the large numbers that this person was getting in terms of views. And I said, you know, David trumps that any day of the week. You know. Now remember, I'm not saying. This you're justifies not the, you're not your method, yeah, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I, I'm just saying if that's your criteria for yeah, why it it's wrong, that person it doesn't make any sense. And then he said, "Well, this just turns people away and that sort of thing." And I said, "Have you seen these videos?" I mean, and I and I sent the videos that you did a long time ago of people cursing you one week or threatening to to cut off your head uh, one month, and mm-hmm. then later attributing your video mm-hmm. as the 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 you know what prodded them and and, and got them thinking about Islam. And in many cases, they even came to Christ, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there, there's two steps to this. They got to leave Islam. They got to come to Christ. Some do come to Christ. Some only leave Islam. Uh, but in either case, it's a, it's a blessing to the world, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, you, you've, you've reduced the number of potential uh, terrorists, uh, oh. you know. So so anyway, so what I, uh, I'll just call this person Mr. X. Mm-hmm. But it's one of my favorite lines ever. Uh, this, this, so I this, remember it. This, this person... <laughs> This person said, you have to know your Bible to catch this. This person said, you know, uh, he, he's appealing to numbers and, and effectiveness. If, if this method results in more people converting, then it's better. And he's apparently unaware of how many people are being converted through the method that David's employing. And so I said, uh, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I gave him all these videos of these people saying they converted uh, through this. And I said, David has slain his thou, or excuse me, I said, Mr. X. person <laughs> X has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Now, now for those of you who don't know, that's in the Bible. Yeah, that that goes back to the Old Testament. Remember, Saul was king, and then David, uh, you know, in, in in his various exploits on behalf of Israel, uh, had uh, you know been very effective in battle in uh, uh, defeating Israel's enemies. And so even though David wasn't king at that time, the people started chanting, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Mm-hmm. And Saul was just, you know, incredibly incensed when he when he heard that. Uh, so anyways. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and how, those conversations normally go, uh, uh, David, this will never work. You're just going to drive Muslims away. <laughs> you, know, I go, you obviously haven't been paying attention because here, here are all these uh, tons of Muslims who left Islam. And they say, yeah, but it's unbiblical. And I showed them a bunch of stuff in the Bible where they were coming out blasting. Um, and then it goes back to, yeah, but it would work It would work better if you did it this way. And then it's, okay, first you go show me. You go do everything you're saying and then come back and, and show that you've got, a, you've got a better way. And then I'll, uh, I'll think about it. All right, guys. <laughs> Fred Sanford says, David has blocked thousands, but Sam tens of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> All right, everyone, we have to uh, we have to cut out now. But Lord willing, we will be back tomorrow. So let us know what you want us to cover in the comments. And it doesn't have to be just me and Anthony. We should one night while you're here see if we can get you, me, and Sam all on. You know what I mean? That might be interesting to uh, try because I have multiple cameras. So I could, in theory, have a camera at you and a camera at me. And then Sam on by Skype and have us all three side by side. But um, I would have to test that. All right. Catch you all tomorrow.